Um, now this graph is kind of hard to see. The green says pork, the uh, red is poultry, the blue is beef, the uh, like olive green is farm fish, and then the orange is sheep and goats. Um, and then it says the percent change in per capita global production of protein um, from poultry is what? So we have poultry is here, and then poultry up here. So um, this is about 90 to 110 percent. The percent change in global capita production of protein from farm fish was um, between 1980 and 2000 was about uh, 25 to 45 percent. And then the percent change in per capita production from um, Beef between 1961 and 2009 was approximately, it basically stayed the same. Just want to make sure you guys can see this. The acronym GNOL refused, refers to. Genetically, let me see if I can spin out this one a little bit. Modified organism. And this is basically something that um, has been created using artificial selection. That might not be so big. Next. And again, I'm going to try and go through these as fast as I can um, because we have like 55 slides to go through tonight. Um, and I just want to try and go through them as quickly as possible for you guys. Um, so we're going to range these foods in highest to lowest in terms of global production. Uh, we have corn. Then wheat, then oops. arrange the foods in order and highest of lowest in innovations. Um, okay, so this one, oops, I, okay, so this is the question. List four innovations that led to the Green Revolution. I was like, what did I write here? Um, so GMOs or artificial selection. Irrigation. Synthetic pesticides and herbicides. and synthetic fertilizers. Next, okay, draw and label an illustration of a pesticide treadmill. So this is gonna be time. And this is gonna be um, pest population on the y-axis. Okay, and I'm going to kind of draw it and then I'll explain. Okay, so right here is when they tend to apply the pesticides. And then you can see that the population goes down, right? And then here, they use a new pesticide. And then here they'll use another new pesticide. Okay. 
in here. Um, uh, we'll use another one. These are both new pesticide. And here, when the pest population starts going up, this is when um, the pest population starts becoming resilient to the previous pesticide. And that's why they have to get new pesticides over and over again. Okay, explain how biomagnification of DDT led to the near demise of the bald eagle population in the US. Okay, so um, DDT um, affected calcium production. For use in eagles, especially females, which cause thin eggshells. As a small prey. Eight plants with DDT. On them, the chemical accumulated. And biomagnified in eagles when eagles ate it. When they ate the prey. Okay. What is difference about growing plants hydroponically? You just grow without soil. Um, and by the way, after this presentation, I'll go ahead and um, when I do the links, I'll um, also put up a link to the um, the slideshow as a PDF in case you want to use it as like um. um flashcards or whatever. Um, so you'll have that as well. Um, so the Green Revolution was the um, advancement in science and synthetic grain. And other foods. And fertilizers, lots of ands. That led to huge increases of crop yield, which allows us to feed more people on the same amount of land more efficient. So a technique used to harvest scallops, crabs, and shrimp from the sea floor is called dredging. And this is very disruptive to the environment because you're basically taking a net 
and um, has like a weight along the bottom and it just scrapes everything off of the seafloor. A fishing practice commonly used to catch large solitary species featured in the movie The Perfect Storm is long line fishing. Two environmental benefits of wetlands. Um, I'm going to give you more than two because uh, I think it's important. Flood control, they are natural filters. And then for your bonus benefits, I have breeding ground for birds. Nursery for fish. The four major zones of life in the appropriate areas on the diagram, and if this was a temperate lake. Okay, so I'm going to try and do multiple colors here. This right here is what they would call the littoral zone. on both sides. Um, then we have the climatic And you have a let's see it moves green. Hopefully you can see it. Okay, so this is the benthic right here. These are things that live on the ground. And then in between the limnotic and the benthic is your profundal zone. An hour of energy, and this this one is really long, so just keep that in mind. Um, so a passive solar house. Um, I did not draw this on my keys. I was, I was lazy. So just gonna kind of give you idea of what it would look like. Um, there's this really good image that I see all the time online that I really like and I wanted to find it for you guys. Um, so I could try and draw. Like this, like this. So big window. Okay. So um, this is your summer sun. You can see that it's kind of, it's going to hit that roof. And so it's not going to come inside. And so it's not going to get you too hot. And then the winter sun isn't as high up in the sky. So it will actually get into the window and allow you to, um, allow you to uh, um, allow it to heat the home. Okay, and then um, so let's see, they have like a bunch of stuff in here and I don't know that any of it is really all that important. Um, the big part is uh, this roof line, which protects from the summer sun, but then this window um, 
a lot of warmth. Winter sun. The one in the house. Okay. Okay, so this one we're going to do some math. So we have um, 40 meters squared, and now that I can write it, it should work better. Um, and six kilowatt hours per meter squared per day. So we're gonna cross off our meter squared. We have 40 times six, which is 240 kilowatt hours per day. And then one day, that's 24 hours. So then we'll need to divide the 240 by 24. How these numbers work out well. Um, that's kind of how the um, AP exam works. Um, we like to give you numbers that work out nicely. Um, if you were allowed calculators, then they wouldn't give you nice numbers. So it's kind of a blessing in disguise to have um, no calculators. Okay, so then you'll have. Um, 10 kilowatt hours is what you should get, right? But the average electricity um, is um, 1.2 kilowatt hours per hour. So we're gonna take that 1.2 kilowatt hours per hour and we're gonna divide it by 10. And that'll give us our efficiency. This will be 0.12, we'll multiply that by 100. That will give us 12%. And so if this was an FRQ question, you would need to show all of this work in order to get all your points. So just keep that in mind. Um, so now we have a 60 watt bulb that is used for four hours a day. So how many kilowatt hours does it use? So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to Convert my watts to kilowatts. So there's a thousand watts in one kilowatt, which is going to give me six kilowatts. And we use it four hours a day. That's one, two, four, four hours a day. So now we need to figure out how many per year. So we're doing zero point two four kilowatt hours a day. Now we need two sixty five. Is in one year. Eighty six kilowatt hours a year. Now we want to list our links of coal. So um, the lowest energy content is peat. Then we have what is called lignite and bituminous. You may have heard this term bituminous coal and anthracite. Now some characteristics of these, right? We're gonna have um these are actually low to high. So peat has the most moisture, which makes sense, right? Because peat is found where in like uh, wetlands and stuff like that. Okay. 
anthracite has the least moisture. So P has the least of carbon. And anthracite has the most. And then P is going to have the least energy. And anthracite. So there's some general characteristics of those, even though they didn't really have a lot. Um, three air pollutants. We have a CO2, that is carbon dioxide. We have SO2, which is sulfur dioxide. We have NO2, which is nitrogen dioxide. And then a bonus one, we have mercury. And that's all for that page two. I had a student once, she uh, said uh, they had to do, they had the symbol and they had to give the element and it said HG and she wrote uh, Wells. She was a really avid reader, but science wasn't really her thing. Um, seven products that are derived primarily from crude oil. We have asphalt. That's what makes most roads. Crease and paints. Naphtha. Diesel oil. Heating oil. Aviation fuel. OPEC refers to the organization of petroleum exporting countries. And um, this is about uh, thirteen countries. that have more than 60% of all oil reserves. Um, originally intended Most of these countries are in the Middle East. Um, it was originally intended to unify policies, basically so each country um, has the same policy. So one doesn't actually do more trading than the other and they're not competing with each other. Um, So they basically all agree to like all sort of same prices and that sort of stuff and all do the same things. That way they all get money instead of just, instead of having to constantly compete with each other. Um, so fracking is a name for hydraulic fracturing. This is a way they get natural gas. Um, it causes groundwater contamination. Terrestrial instability. This is basically earthquakes. Um, there's been a lot of earthquakes near fracking areas recently. And it releases methane, which is a very powerful greenhouse gas. So, what was Deepwater Horizon? 
Um, Deepwater Horizon is what we know of as the BP oil spill. It was on April 20th, um, 2010. And an explosion caused an 87 day leak. Leading to almost 210 million gallons. Of oil in the ocean. Like the worst in history. ANWR is the Alaska National Wildlife Refuge. And um, it's important because it um, it protects um, Organisms in the area. It's a large uh, refuge, but it's also the location of an oil reserve. So um, environmentalists and um, companies are constantly fighting and constantly wanting to uh, drill there and get oil out. So here's another math problem. A family has 1,500 watts of light bulbs throughout their house, but they're replacing them with LED bulbs, which use 90% less energy. How much energy will they use? So we're going to take our 1,500 watts. We're going to multiply it by 10%. And we will get. Now, here's another one. It's still using 1500 watts, but we're going to, you know, figure out how much it costs. Okay, so our space heater uses 1500 watts. If it's used for 10 hours each day for a week, then the cost of electricity is 20 hours. 20 cents per kilowatt hour, how much will it cost for the week? So we're going to take 1500 kilo, uh, watts and we're going to multiply it. Um, we're going to convert it to kilowatts. And then if we use it for 10 hours a day, then we're going to get 15 kilowatt hours a day. So we can take our 15 kilowatt hours a day and multiply that by seven days, one week. Twenty seven is one hundred and five kilowatt hours a week times twenty cents is and again if this was an FRQ you'd have to show all that work. Um species that may be threatened by the destruction of a solar power tower in the California desert. Um you can pick a bunch. Um I'll list a couple desert tortoise. Um, there's probably many reptiles. There's probably some rodent species. And then the, the key for this AP exam worksheet actually talks about a big horn sheep. But um, the AP exam usually doesn't really use anything that specific. Um, the active ingredient in a fully rotated cell is silicon. So, semiconductors. 
or things you can do to conserve energy. Of course, there's lots of things you can do to um, conserve energy, but um, a few of them are. Let's get energy efficient appliances. You could um, walk, ride your bike, carpool. You could have south facing windows on your house. Get LED lighting. Get a programmable thermostat. On and on and on. But there's five. Um, Chernobyl is um, located in the Ukraine. At the time, it was USSR, though. So that just, just doesn't exist anymore. Um, Nuclear reactor exploded. And sent large amounts of radioactive debris. And it spread across Europe. The um the town in which it was located was called um Pripyat. I may not be spelling that correctly, but um they were evacuated and it's still not safe to live there. You can actually go on tours of um, Chernobyl and they're like limited to like 15 minutes. That's kind of interesting. Okay, so let's talk about uh, mining. So let's see, um, open pit mining uh, removes mineral soils and everything and it digs basically a giant pit. Okay, um, so it clears the land. Um, lots of erosion. Surface water. Acid mine drainage. We haven't even talked about like habitat stuff. Okay, subsurface mines um, extracts from deep underground. If you've watched the Hunger Games, that's what Katniss's dad did. Um, and Gale, I think, ended up working in the mines. Cave ends, you can have explosions. The explosions will kill your dad. Um, you get black lung, and you don't make a lot of money. Which low pay is not really an environmental consequence, so let me take that out. I don't need that. Uh, strip mining is a surface mining, and it actually strips the surface with a bulldozer. It's 
strips of surface with a bulldozer. And it um, leaves chunks of soil, promotes erosion, as we can see. Um, so it's basically everything that open pit mining does as well. Mountaintop removal, um, it's, it's just like strip mining, but they um, use explosives. And cables to actually pull down the mountain. We're going to destroy forests. Very streams. And then heavy metals will be in the bottom. In addition to um, everything that open pit mining does. And then drilling, um, basically like fracking, and oil rigs. We use a giant drill, which is why it's called drilling. And so it causes um, instability. The ground and water contamination. All those consequences of fracking, you could put those there. That was a long one. Okay, strengthen the weak statement. Uh, mining causes pollution that may disrupt the environment. So for this one, you want to say exactly what kind of pollution. Okay, so you want to say like um, okay, you want to be specific. So you might say something like, um, mining causes water pollution. In the form of acid mine drainers. Could kill fish. Um, Three Mile Island was a nuclear reactor in the U.S. A lot of times we hear about these things and we think, oh, well, that doesn't happen here. Well, it did. Um, in 1979. Uh, a cooling malfunction led to a partial meltdown. Um, but not enough was released. To evacuate or harm any of our homes. What was the worst of this? Chernobyl is probably the worst ever. Definitely the most famous. How is thermal produced during um, pollution produced by the power plant? So um, basically, um, Heat is produced in combustion. It heats water. 
which turns to steam. Which turns the generator. And then um, cool water is used. Should be 2O. Uh, I mean 2O. Cool water is used to condense. which then warms that water and then it's released into nearby waterways. What happened at Fukushima? Um, this was in Japan, a tsunami, which was caused by an earthquake. Caused a failure. And they actually had, um, they actually had three backup systems. Well, including the first system, it was really three. Um, and they all failed. Um, flooded the generators. And released short term radiation. And they actually found like, um, like iodine on like the coast of California right afterwards. Hopefully it was, um, what was released had a really short half-life. Um, okay, so a radioactive cloud may contain iodine-131, which has a half-life of eight days. If the waste has decayed to a concentration of less than 0.1%, we can to say if it will take how many days to reach safe levels. Okay, so for this, you have 100, and after one half life, you'll have 50%. After two half life, you'll have 25%. After three, you'll have 12.5%. After four, you'll have 6.25%. After five, you'll have 3.125. After, where are we at? Six. You'll have 1.5625%. After seven, you'll have 0 0.7. And after three percent. After eight, you'll have 0.3991%. After nine, you'll have 0 0.195%. And then by 10 half lives, you'll have 0 0.098, which is your less than 0.1. Okay, so that's 10 half-lives, one, two, three, four. Basically, each arrow is a half-life. So you do 10 times eight, it's 80 days. Thirty one. This family has a 75 meter squared solar array on their house. It has efficiency of 10%, the average insulation on their array is six kilowatt hours per meter square per day and the average cost of electricity is 20 cents per kilowatt hour they can make how much electricity a day and how much from the sun okay so we have 75 meters squared we're going to multiply that by six kilowatt hours per meter squared per day that's going to give us 450 kilowatt hours per day, 10% efficiency, 6.1, it's going to give us 45 kilowatt hours per day, and then 10 20 cents per kilowatt hour.
nine dollars to And if you want to do it from here, here's just for days and here. Should take you thirty to eighty five dollars a month. Not too bad. Okay, so a diagram that shows how electricity is produced by a dam. So this is going to be our dam. This is our water reservoir. Um, in Georgia, there's Lake Lanier. This would be like Lake Lanier. And then this is your river. It's fishing. Here's that. Um, and then right here, you have a thing that looks like a flower, but it's really a turbine. And um, water goes through the turbine and it produces um, electricity. That, uh, Goes to like the generator. Got cost of gas is three fifty a gallon, and the average gas mileage of the car is twenty five miles per gallon. The cost of driving the car per mile is how much? So we have three dollars fifty cents. Gas mileage is of one gallon is twenty five miles. So only for a dollar a mile or fourteen cents. Acronym M I N D Y refers to not in my backyard. And the first time I heard about this was about um, like nuclear waste facilities. Backyard is two minutes, I guess. Um, they refer to like nuclear waste facilities or power plants. Or landfills, and it's basically um, people don't want these near their home, but they have to be somewhere. Okay, end of the, we're uh, seeing the end of the tunnel. Okay, identify three examples of renewable resources and three of non-renewable. So um, non-renewable could be fossil fuels, which um, coal, oil, natural gas, all of those are considered fossil fuels. Um, nuclear fuel and metal all of those things once we've used them all we've used them all there's nothing left a uh, renewable could be water wind solar now these are energy sources we could also have um, trees geothermal energy Any of that kind of stuff. Anything that you could get more of. Okay. 
can sketch and label these on the map of the world. The equator. Let me try and give you some different colors here. So there's your equator, your Tropic of Cancer. Capricorn, here. 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 Mm, maybe orange. Okay, now I'm going to label the countries. Um, let's see, we've got Brazil here. We have Ethiopia over here. China over here. India, right there, Bangladesh, and Fremont. This is kind of a joke. Um, Fremont is the Place that they always talk about um, in the FRQs. And then let's talk about upwelling. Um, so we've got warm water here. We have reduced upwelling here. Then here we're going to have This horizontal line is a strong current. Oh, that's a lot of things to fit on one map. So, if you're importing rare tropical hardwoods, what are some you know, laws or treaties that you may have violated. This is really important because like sometimes um, you'll have an FRQ that'll ask you uh, about, and they'll ask you like which, sorry, I can't talk right. Um, you'll have an FRQ and it'll say like, Think of a piece of legislation that relates to this. And so these are, um, this is an example. So CITES um, works with endangered species. The Lacey Act prohibits uh, illegally required wild, wildlife and the Kyoto Protocol um, reduces greenhouse gas emissions. We are almost done. Um, so basically um, anything that, that will, um, when you're using common resources, you 
without restraint. Okay, and some examples of this are um, overfishing in the ocean or um, air quality. Air is a common, it affects everyone. Um, the approximate age of the earth is 4.5 billion years. The first national park was Yellowstone. This is an example of one of those, like, um, sometimes it shows up on there. And it's one of those, like, easy FRQs because, you know, it doesn't really take a lot of brain power for that one. Um, smallest to largest, you'll have clay is the smallest, then silt is the smallest. And then if we want to, um, the aluminum, or the, um, sorry, the elements with their ore, um, aluminum is uh, bauxite, and iron is hematite. Uranium is pitch blend, lead is galena, and silicone 